this is Shadow Pope's Gypsy Angel Kifu from Los Angeles, California. When I'm not listening to podcasts with my dad, I'm stuck in Benjamin's. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and to celebrate tomorrow's birthday of J.P. Morgan, a personal friend of mine, we thought today we'd turn over a new leaf here and talk about money. Our special guest today with tips about building a network to lean on for profit, we welcome the host of the Jordan Harbinger Show, Jordan Harbinger. Plus, we'll share headlines about a big bank in the news with some fake accounts again. Plus, throw out the Haven Lifeline to a lucky listener, answer a question from the mailbag, and top it all off with my incredible trivia. Ah, forget J.P. Morgan. Here are two guys who are the Ben and Jerry of financial podcasting, Joe and O-J-J-J-J-J-G. Chunky monkey for the win, baby. I do like me some Ben and Jerry's. New York super fudge chunk. Oh, that is so good. So I should have gone there first, but I took the chunky monkey. Hey, welcome to the Ice Creaming for Fun and Profit podcast. I'm Joe Saul Cihai, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And across the card table from me is that ice cream eating fool, the OG. You should have seen this bowl of ice cream I had yesterday. I had a banana. Then two scoops of vanilla, two scoops of chocolate, chocolate syrup, strawberry jelly, and then a dollop of peanut butter. That sounds so gross. I had a coma. (laughs) Nice sleep after ice cream. That's always good. Oh, Oh, I passed out. Yep. Like I I passed out with a spoon in my mouth still. (laughs) Diabetic shock. That can be dangerous. You know, you don't get any of that, by the way, if you would have just had an RX bar. Thanks. There's that. Thanks to RX Bar for supporting Stacky Benjamins. RX Bar is my whole food go-to protein bar with no BS. Get 25% off your first order at rxbar.com forward slash SB and use the promo code SB. That's rxbar.com forward slash SB, promo code SB. You know, they tend not to like it when you say uh, 25% off your order because you're a Stacky Benjamins fan, which I did last time. Yes, your first order. In other words, they tell me to say first order, and I just say, 25% off. Everybody get it. Give away the store. Apparently, there were some people. You can take your RX bars and dip them in ice cream. (laughs) Delicious. Make an RX bar sandwich where you put two (laughs) RX bars and put ice cream in between, mush them together. Mm. It, like, cancels each other out. Have you ever had a BL RX bar sandwich? (laughs) Let's (laughs) Thanks to House Call Pro also, by the way, for supporting Stacking Benjamins. This is a cool company, man. If you own a service-oriented business, I get so frustrated with some of the service-oriented businesses at Mom's House here lately. If you want to get your service business organized and streamlined with your customers, go to housecallpro.com slash SB. They're going to waive your $99 activation fee because you listen to us. Go to housecallpro.com slash SB. Don't think you can screw up. I th- hopefully you only can activate it one time, so I can't mess up that one. <laughs> We're going to try to mess up the entire show today, but we can't do it too much so because far, so Jordan Harbinger coming down to the basement. Love this guy. Just straight talk 101 with Jordan Harbinger. That's what he should have called his podcast, Straight Talk 101. But uh, we've got some headlines first, so let's do it. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. First headline comes to us from Investment News. This written by John Wagoner, who writes all over the place. I usually see him in USA Today. A few places for advisors or clients to hide in this stock correction. International bonds and various alternative investments offer little solace. I forgot that sometimes in the worst of the worst, you go try to hide out in international bonds. Like the international bond manager (laughs) waits for a day. Not that bond. Oh, that's not that international bond? No, no. International bond. Bond, Austrian bond. But the bonds, uh, these bond managers sit there because, you know, 
when you go to work for Fidelity, you're all excited. You're out of college. And then almost like the sorting hat with Harry Potter, you know, <laughs> large cap value. You're like, yeah, <laughs> small cap growth. Yes. International bond. What? Oh, oh no. And then the old crusty fund manager puts their arm around you and says, you know what, son? Someday there's going to be a big market correction. This will all be yours. Big market correction. Everybody's going to come running. Not so. <laughs> Mr. Wagner writes, if you're looking to escape this correction, which by the way, this is not a correction yet, OG. It's, nope. n- it's not yet a correction, Mr. Wagner. We're not there. We're down just less than 10 as we r- record this. So uh, the uh, Standard & Poor's 500 stock index fallen nearly 10% since all-time high on January 26th. You can choose your causes, the threat of a trade war with China, worries about rising interest rates, or simply an overpriced market. But the pain felt by your clients, remember this is written for financial advisors, is real. For advisors, finding a place of safety or opportunity has been problematic in large part because most advisors haven't been alive long enough to see similar problems. Oh, man. Is that an echo from a prior show of ours? A prior show, a prior like 20 shows. 20 shows? Yeah, you this, see- is, this is the crazy thing, right? If you've got an advisor that has 10 years of experience or let's say nine, right? They've never seen a recession. Like how long have you been in business? Nine years. Excellent. You have no idea what to do. Okay. It's, it's been a long, long time since a major trade war. The last one was the Smoot. Yeah, dang it. The Smoot Holly Tariff of 1930. Remember that Smoot Holly Tariff? Got to get another one of those going. They were. <laughs> If we can get a name like Smoot Holly, I'm all for it. I totally would support it. Put a yellow ribbon around my tree. <laughs> Which rang the death knell of the economic expansion ushered in the Great Depression, said Sam oh, wait, Stovall. Actually, we don't want to do yeah, we don't want that. Chief investment strategist for U.S. equity at CFRA. If we could get the name but not the death knell, I'll take it. And while the U.S. has seen Federal Reserve rate hikes, the last major Fed campaign to raise rates was 2004 to 2006, when the central bank pushed from 1% to five and a quarter in a series of 17 hikes. So far in this cycle, the Fed's nudge rates up six times. Bonds, the traditional panacea in a bear market, have been of limited use in part because interest rates have risen this year. We're in the perfect storm, OG. Interest rates going up, so I can't hide there in bonds. What do I do if I'm trying to escape the bumpy ride? You're trying to trick me, I know. The thing is to do nothing. This is the trade-off. This is the other side of the stick that you get. So you can't have last year's great market returns over you know the past 15 months without trading off a couple of weeks of volatility. So this is when you just maybe if you're too chicken little, you just don't open your statements maybe for a while or turn off the news. I don't know why you'd be watching the news anyway, but this stuff is really – really quite annoying literature, isn't it? Like, look at all this stuff. Oh my gosh, we can't do anything. Where do we hide our client money? Huh? Like for four weeks, six weeks? Yawn. Call me in three months. (laughs) But what if it's not over in three months? I mean, this could be the... Hallelujah. I mean, people, we did this on uh, my, the little money in the morning show to Jack Bogle said he's never seen a market like this. And he's been around for one or two more markets than you or I. I think Jack Bogle needs to make sure he's in the headlines a little bit more. So he's going to say random crap like that. I've never seen anything like this before. Really? Never seen the market go up a whole bunch and then down a little bit. That's crazy. He's talk. He was talking about going from almost no volatility. I mean, you look at the chart of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It's like somebody flipped a switch and now we've got an EKG going. Yeah. But so what? And the other problem with that is when you look at those charts, right? You got to look at the scale of those charts. And what I mean by that is if you look at it over like the tick by tick trade, it looks pretty crazy, right? But just expand the scale. Look at it over the last three years. Look at it over the last. I was looking at a No, man. No, I was looking at a one year chart. I went and looked at the one year chart and holy cow, it literally looks like an EKG versus smooth ride up. Like somebody slowly pulls this sled uphill and then send you back down the most craggy. Well, then you should sell everything and go into international bonds. <laughs> Make international bond fund manager's mother proud. <laughs> or alternative investments. That's a great idea too, by the way. We should get rid of this liquidity that we have in 
you know, our good ETF diversified mutual fund portfolio. Let's lock that money up in some uh, business development companies. Guaranteed 7% yield or, uh, oh, I got it, a non-traded REIT or maybe a 10-year kind of lockup period in a hedge fund. Those would be all great places to hide money for the for the foreseeable future. That'll be, you are feisty today, man. Poke the bear, baby. <laughs> You get both sides. Our second piece comes to us from uh, Bloomberg. Uh, Wells Fargo Wealth Management used similar incentives to those behind fake account scandal. Uh Uh-oh. Can you say uh uh-oh? U.S. authorities investigating whether the unit inappropriately sold clients' in-house investments. Uh, Credit card and savings customers may not be the only ones who were misled by Wells Fargo and company. Some clients of the bank's wealth management division were steered into investments that maximize revenue for the bank and compensation for its employees, according to several people familiar with the unit and documents reviewed by Bloomberg. Those investments weren't always in the best interest of clients, the people said. They included estates, trusts, and loans, according to one of the people and the documents. Wealth advisors as recently as 2016 were given ambitious quotas and could earn extra pay by steering clients into loans and accounts with recurring fees, said the people who included one current and five former Wells Fargo advisors. So one current and five uh, bitter ex-advisors. What's the the current guy still hanging out? (laughs) What do you? Look at all this crap we're doing. It's awesome. But my paychecks rock. I'm still here. I'm still here. What other sales incentives? If if you if this okay. Right. Have we figured it out yet that when you have a company that you work for, your service is to that organization, regardless of what the title says on your business card. Right. You you are indebted to the shareholders profitability of that organization. The customer be damned. And that is true everywhere. Right. And so it doesn't matter what fancy title wealth manager, senior vice president of wealth building services. Who gives a crap with that, all that stuff? If there's a corporation ahead of it, their obligation is to the corporation. Well, and if you have any organization, whether it's this or Best Buy or whatever, if you put a sales incentive in front of people, in front of a large group of people, there's going to be a percentage, and Wells Fargo is a big, big company, there's going to be a percentage of people that are going to game the game, right? You put a game in front of people, people are going to game the game. It's going to happen. So it the- happens in everything. It happens in everything. It happens in every sport. It happens in every activity, business related. If there's, if there's an incentive, you're going to try to go for the incentive. I didn't mention Best Buy accidentally. I remember an expose, like, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago about how Best Buy has been known for not having commissioned salespeople. Their salespeople don't get commissioned, but they have sales incentives for different reward levels and stuff to sell one line of product over another. And it was a shock. This this, this big, no, it wasn't a shock at all. I'm like, wow, this is is great. This is like they recycle the bread at restaurants. Or recycle the main course at restaurants. (laughs) uh, Yeah. (laughs) Uh, recycled main course i think if i do business with any big company i think talk about when you poke the bear you get both sides you seriously you get the safety and security of the big company and some of the oversight that comes with that but you also get the sales well but you also get the sales incentives and the the gamification maybe that comes with people at a big company too Mm -hmm. yes sir I think uh, that's lesson number one. Lesson number two is looking for security. Maybe it's better to think long-term. What do you think of that? I like that plan. Jordan Harbinger is a guy who I've known for a few years Jordan used to be the proprietor of a little podcast, little tiny podcast called Art of Charm. If you heard of that, he just had something big happen at Art of Charm. I'm going to let him tell this story because the story is important. Whether you work for somebody else in the nine to five or you're building your own business, it's always important, OG, to have your network intact. You can't start building your network when you need it because nobody wants to help the needy person they don't have time. But if you've got a bunch of people that you're already close to that can help you when 
you're in your time of need, I think there's a big lesson there, no matter what you do to make money. And so let's talk about building a bigger paycheck by building your network. Jordan Harbinger coming down the stairs. Look at you, man. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Things have been kind of crazy lately. <laughs> they, have, they have been. I'm laughing, but what happened to you isn't funny. Most people know you as the host of Art of Charm, but they're going to know you as something else. And maybe a lot of people already know what happened, but tell us, tell us the story. What happened? Yeah. So I won't sugarcoat it. I actually got fired from the Art of Charm, which was crazy. I never, people go, what? How do you get fired from a company you co-founded? You do if you set things up in your 20s and you don't know what you're doing with business and you're like, everyone should get equity who's here right now because we're all friends or like everyone's adding sort of the same amount of value when you're 26 and then now you're 38 and you're like, wait a minute, this isn't really the same company that I started. And there was just a lot of that kind of drama in an environment that wasn't a good fit for me. And we negotiated an amicable split and then that didn't, uh, I'll just put it, this way did not work out the way that we had negotiated it. Then the guys who were there now ended up firing almost every single person that worked there, including me and the whole podcast team. And so I regrouped. I do. I now do the Jordan Harbinger show. And it turns out that it's probably the best thing that's happened to me in a long time. That's a lot to swallow. I want to get back to the very beginning of this. So when did you first get your inkling that it wasn't going right? Because, you know, there's people sitting at their desk at a job and they know that the job's not going right, though, but they keep thinking maybe it's going to get better. Was that you or what? did it just come out oh, of the blue? Yeah. No, that was me for years. I remember being like, well, my team doesn't really like it here that much. And a lot of there's a lot of this is going wrong. That's going wrong. This is going wrong. That's going wrong. Maybe when we make more money, things will be better. Maybe when we do this product launch, things will be better. Maybe when we do this other thing, this will be better. It just turned out that those weren't the problems, right? The problems were different ones. And I don't want to get into too much detail on what they sure, were. And right. It doesn't really matter no. anyway what they were. But it, it turned out that it was it had to do with some other things in the business. And those were the real problems. And it's kind of like in a relationship where you're like, oh, well, you know, I really like her or him, but you know, things will be better when she gets a raise. Things will be better when we move in together. Things will be better when we have kids. And then you find out like, oh crap, now we moved in together and have kids and it's still terrible or this is still happening. And so I really looked at this business in all the right ways up until recently, and then it was sunk cost fallacy all the way home, if that makes sense. It, it does make sense. And it's funny because you're reminding me of a story that uh, I heard Jack Canfield say, the chicken soup for the soul guy, 1-800-Flowers, I believe, talking about uh, he's at a dinner party and he sees Jack Welch from, of course, from General Electric, walks up to Jack Welch and said to Jack, hey, we've got this We've got this guy at the company is really not working out. We think it might, you know, things might get better. And Jack turns to him and just said, you know, I've never had a case, never, ever had a case where if I let it go for another six months, it got better. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and by the way, you don't come across to me as that type of guy that, that, I mean, you come across to me as a guy that you see something's wrong, you address it immediately. Yeah. You know, I am actually that type of person, generally speaking, but I will tell you, this was one of those situations where I knew I couldn't leave quietly, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because what had happened was through creating the show and building it up to 4 million downloads a month and everything like that, it turned out that I ended up being the, the face of the entire company. Right. And so when I was thinking, Hey, you know, we should split this, I should leave. It was kind of like, no way. No, not, no, we're going to make sure that that doesn't happen. And so I knew I could never kind of leave in my own volition. So I realized, all right, well, if this whole thing is going to kind of get vindictive, if I try to leave, then I guess I'm going to stick around and then I'll figure out how to maneuver around it. And so I siloed myself. I worked on projects with my team. I developed my personal brand. I worked on things on the side, you know, things like that. And then it eventually just got to the point where none of us could ignore it. And it got to a point where I realized I'm never going to be able to grow to my full potential inside this company. It's always going to be limiting. You know, we have a, uh, the art of charm is a brand that sort of to some people sounds a little goofy. I agree with that stigma in many ways, 
I wasn't able to have certain kinds of guests on the show because they, I had to shill dating products, you know, and the guests didn't want to be on the show that had that. And I don't disagree with that sort of analysis. I think that people protecting their brands didn't want to be on there. And I, I kept getting notes like, how do I get people to listen to your show? And I realized, you know, other podcasts don't have that because the way you get your friends to listen to the show is you say, Hey, you should listen to this show. <laughs> but when you have a goofy name, then when you say, Hey, you should listen to the show, your friends say, I don't want to, what you don't think I'm charming or I don't need this. This is stupid. This is manipulative, whatever it is. There's all this stigma. And I thought, you know, no brand that has really just crushed it and really done well for the person who's running it, which would at that point was me. I can't sit there and fight the stigma. And I always wanted to rebrand, but I was not allowed to do that. And the reason was because the consequences of having a brand that nobody believed in were kind of mine alone, right? I was the one who had my face on it. I was the one who had my name on it. And the other guys didn't really care. They wanted to make money. And I understand that sentiment completely. It's just that that wasn't working out well for me. And so those disagreements gradually became something that we could not ignore. And then when we negotiated the amicable split, I think what happened is it sounded great in the moment. And then it kind of like certain people in that agreement realized, wait a minute, I don't think we can actually do this in, in an amicable way because then it looks like we lost. And that wasn't an option for them. And so it was more like, I, and I'd rather be right than do this split right. And that is what ended up happening to the company. Luckily, I have all the relationships. I ended up leaving with pretty much the entire team. And so I was able to reform the Jordan Harbinger show. And we got the first month, we got 1.4 million downloads because of the audience migration. Well, that's actually what I want to talk about because I want to talk about the power of networking, which is something that you're awesome at. I barely know you and you've introduced me to people. You've uh, facilitated relationships between me and other people. And I want to talk about that. But for somebody sitting in, at a nine to five job right now, is there some type of lesson for that person? I, I mean, if somebody doesn't feel like the career is right for them, make the move now. Is there something you wish you'd done differently? Is there some learning there for us? Yeah, a couple of things. Some of the stuff that I did wrong was obviously letting this stuff go way too long. Not, I should say this growing a business in your twenties is different than growing a business in your thirties. And you kind of, every year you have to reevaluate your situation. And if you're sitting at a nine to five job every year, just check in with yourself, you know, whether it's in January or in June, it doesn't matter. Check in with yourself. Am I going where I want to go? Am I getting the opportunities I want to get? Had I really done a good earnest check-in and journaled it instead of just like getting distracted with email or whatever in the middle of doing it, I would have figured it out years ago. And honestly, I knew years ago, 2020 hindsight, that this was a big, big problem. There were endemic problems in the business in my position in it. It's just that I ignored those because I thought, like I said before, that we could make things better. And also, oh my gosh, how am I ever going to rebuild this? But all of that turned out to be sunk cost fallacy and false. So I would say definitely check in with yourself and make sure that you know what you're getting and where you're going. The things though that I did right by accident, I should say, although these were deliberate actions, were digging the well before you're thirsty. You know, create and maintain relationships before you need them. But here's the thing. I created a ton of relationships over the last 10, 11 years, and I had to do that because I wanted to practice what I preached, and I liked living that way. It made me feel like a good person. I never thought I would actually be thirsty though. That's the thing, right? So when you create those relationships, you're not really thinking one day I'm going to end up out of my butt and I'm going to need this. <laughs> so that turned out to be a massive advantage because what happened was at first I was sort of in disbelief and shock. And then I was really sad. And then I made a list of hundreds of people that I could reach out to for help. And that's why the Jordan Harbinger show has 2 million downloads in the first six weeks, 1.4 in the first month, because I was able to reach out to a massively strong network that I had created over time. If you try to create that network later when you need it, it's like trying to put a spare tire in the trunk of your car after you've got a flat. It's just not possible. It's too late. You know, reaching out to people you don't know and saying, oh, this bad thing happened to me. I need help. That's a quick way to find someone archiving and deleting your email. But if you reach out to people who are essentially your friends or at least acquaintances and saying, look where I found myself you'll find yourself with more opportunity than you can imagine. I mean, I immediately had people being like, let's create a product together. Oh, you're free now? Good. Let's partner up and do another type of business. Hey, why don't you speak at my event? Why don't you do this? I mean, I, I was in a position where I was turning down opportunity the week I got fired from another company. I mean, that doesn't happen. 
You know, that does not happen. It happens when you have a great network, you dig the well before you're thirsty, and you do so by giving generously without the attachment or expectation of getting something in return over a long period of time. And I think that's the key because obviously we wouldn't have you on today if you didn't bring it when you came to our show, right? I mean, you start off, I think, in the relationship with bringing value to the other person and that builds because, you know, you and I both know people that say that they network, right? And we've been to networking events and there's nothing I hate more than a networking event. You know, yeah. I go to a networking event and it's, there's nothing about the person listening. It's all about me shoving what I do down your throat. And the right. way you network is a completely different beast. Yeah. The way that I quote unquote network is always First of all, always being generous and giving without the attachment of anything in return, like I just mentioned, which means what what this does is not only are you helping other people and you're not trying to figure out what's in it for you, which is always a good way to be, you're also getting opportunities that you didn't really know about beforehand. Case in point, I had a toothache a long time ago when I moved to LA. This is pre-Uber. And I ended up not finding a dentist, so I posted on Facebook. And a random stranger helped me find a dentist who was his aunt, actually. That ended up getting him a job as a graphic designer with another friend of mine full time. And he was making coffee at a cafe at this at the time as a job and doing graphics on the side. The reason this happened was because he had sent me his portfolio. I was able to vouch that he was a good person. I sent the portfolio to a friend who had asked me for website stuff a couple of days after I had my tooth fixed. Now, had he been looking for a graphic design job, he never would have found this person. And had I been looking for a dentist and I'd asked everyone that I knew personally, because I still have never met this person in real life, I wouldn't have been able to find a dentist. Since he helped me without the expectation of anything in return, I later on found an opportunity for him purely by coincidence. But the reason we connected was because he was being generous, right? If he was just looking for jobs and thought, oh, this guy needs a dentist, but I don't know him. I'm just looking for graphic design jobs. We never would have connected. So he never would have gotten that job. And who knows? Maybe I'd still have a toothache. It's, so you, it's, I hope not. You know, I hope not. <laughs> but but that's the thing, right? You find these opportunities lie over the horizon. And the only way to see them is to connect with the people that have them because they don't know they have opportunities for you and you don't know you have opportunities for them necessarily. You just have to connect with people and find out how you can help. And that is what we call ABG, always be generous instead of ABC, always be closing. Help other people without the attachment of anything in return. And the other thing that does is it allows you to help people all over the place a lot without poisoning your relationship. If you keep score and you think, well, I've helped uh, my friend Joel three Ugh. times in a row and he's never helped me with anything, now I'm mad at him, suddenly you're like, why the hell is Jordan angry with me? Like, I don't understand why Joe is mad, you know, at me for this or that and the other thing. And you end up with these problems in your relationship because you're poisoning your own relationships, keeping score. You know, you drive your neighbor to the airport three times and you think this guy owes me one. And you say, hey, can you drive me to the airport? And he goes, no, actually, I have to drop my kids off at school. Now you're mad at him. Why? Oh, because you have a covert contract in your head, an agreement that exists in your head but he doesn't have. And then suddenly you're being passive aggressive towards your neighbor and he doesn't really get it. This is what happens when you have these, when you expect something in return, when you keep score, you create these covert contracts and they cause problems in your relationships. So you have to be generous and give without the attachment of anything in return. And you have to not keep score in your relationships. But is it as simple as a mindset shift, Jordan, or is it also, do you use tools? You have an Excel spreadsheet like, okay, it's Tuesday. I'm going to look for opportunities to help Joe today. And then it's Wednesday. I'm going to try to help my mom's neighbor, Doug, or whoever. Do you use, use tools or just mindset? Whenever you see somebody, you're like, it's just that simple. What can I do to help that person? Yeah, it's actually kind of a set of habits, right? So if I meet somebody and they're like, yeah, I'm a CPA and I specialize in cryptocurrency, I don't think, oh, cool, that sounds like accounting. I don't really know anything about that. Or, oh, gee, I'm going to introduce you to other accountants. And they're like, gee, thanks. I don't need one. I am one. But I might think, hmm, all right, you specialize in cryptocurrency. So does that mean you specialize in taxes for crypto investors? Yeah. Okay. I know a bunch of crypto investors. Are you looking for those people? Yeah, I'm looking for those people. So I'll make those connections using what I call the double opt-in introduction, which is where I ask each party beforehand separately if they're comfortable with the intro. And that does a few things. One, it allows me to introduce people to each other and it allows me to sort of scale helping other people, right? Because if I'm a graphic designer, I can either only help people that need graphic design or I can help people of all stripes by connecting two or more people inside my network where I don't have to do work other than making the introduction. So that makes it scalable, but also the double opt-in 
it prevents awkward situations where it's like, Hey, Jordan, meet my friend Joe. And I'm like, yeah, we already know each other. And then that person's kind of embarrassed and you and I just did extra emails and we're like, eh, yeah, cool, man. See you later. Or, Hey, Jordan, meet my friend Joe. And you're like, dude, shoot, I've been ignoring Jordan for like a month in my <laughs> inbox. And now he knows that I got this and now I've got to respond. He's been bugging me about this dumb thing that he's got. And then now you're kind of annoyed with that person. Or, you know, th there's all kinds of other things that can happen with a double opt-in where I might say, hey, Joe, meet my friend Jordan. And I'm like, oh man, I am so busy that I cannot connect with Joe for like a month. And now he just thinks I'm blowing him off. You know, where if you do the double opt-in and you ask separately, you can say, actually, we already know each other. Actually, I'm really busy for the next month. Actually, I don't really like Jordan and I don't want to connect with him, but thanks anyway. You know, there's all kinds of ways out of that and it takes two extra seconds to really create those two separate emails and ask for permission. And when both parties say yes, they value that introduction more because I don't know about you. I've got a lot of introductions sitting in my inbox and I'm kind of like, eh, I'll wait for the other person to reply. But if it's a double opt-in introduction and I know it's that, then I'll just reply right away. I'll get it done. I value it more because the person cared enough to ask me for it, which means they understand and they value my time, That which means they probably value the other people's time. And that's important to me. All three of those situations, I was laughing because I've had them all happen. I've had the, oh yeah. God, oh God, I really don't want to talk to this person. I really, please, please don't introduce me. And they do it anyway. I've also had the, I'm too busy. And the third one, and this one happens, you know, to people like you and I who know quite a few people in our communities, you know, you're being introduced to people that you already know, which by the way, ends up being nice. We like laugh about it usually, but it still, to your point, saves a lot of embarrassment and a little, a lot of time. Also, I love the fact that if I'm doing the double opt-in, it makes my friend realize how much I care about making sure that this is going to be a fit before we actually try to tie the knot, which I think is the important part there. Exactly. It shows you put just a little bit of extra thought into the introduction and you're not just like an introduction machine where you go, oh, this person's not even thinking about this because if they were, they would have said, hey, do you know Joel? And, and it's like, yeah, I do. Oh, okay, cool. Do you know uh, Jennifer Liao? No, I don't. Oh, I'll make the introduction. It's like, why are you introducing me to people that I do already know? You don't need to do that. Just focus on something that's valuable because then it's not valuable for three people instead of just not valuable for one, right? right? It's right. like, a, thanks for scaling time wasting. It just doesn't make any sense. This is the kind of stuff you talk about on your new show. Um, and I want to talk about this for a second because it's not far off Art of Charm, but it isn't the Art of Charm. Like you're doing right. something different here, Jordan. Tell everybody what you're doing on the new show because it's really cool. Sure. Thank you. So the Jordan Harbinger show, what I really do is I, I study the, the thoughts, habits, actions of brilliant people who've done really great stuff and ask them what I hope are interesting questions so that my audience can apply the same wisdom for themselves. So I want to take other people's superpowers, deliver them to the listener. So it's not just about the guest. It's about what the guest can teach to the listener. So I'll have Larry King come on and talk about conversational skills. I'll have a CIA agent come on and talk about how to read people. And then we teach those same skills to the listening audience. And every episode of the show has worksheets so that every single episode of the Jordan Harbinger show has practical things that the audience can actually use right out of the box. So it's not just like chit chat conversation or, or learning. And then you're in the car and you can't take notes. It's like, there's a worksheet so that you know, you're getting the information out of it. And you're not just trying to absorb it through osmosis. Our show comes with dad jokes and yours comes with worksheets. So, Hey, right. you get your dad show jokes here. You get your worksheets from you. It's like the double threat. That's right. I have dad jokes too, but yours are better. <laughs> I don't know if I, nobody will say ours are better. Ours are more frequent, Jordan. So where can everybody get it? Sure. Any podcast app should have the Jordan Harbinger show. It's also on Spotify, or you can be, you can do things the hard way and go to jordanharbinger.com slash subscribe. And there's a bunch of different places there that'll have it. But I feel like everybody who's listening to you right now should know how to use podcasts. And they they probably do. Maybe they're not the kind of people I want listening. <laughs> maybe, anyway. maybe not. That is a good point, man. Thanks a lot for hanging out with us for a few minutes, man. I appreciate it. Thank you, man. Hey there, trivia nerds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and tomorrow we pay homage to that great man who shaped banking, my buddy J.P. Morgan from the seventh grade. I tell you what, there was this one time in seventh grade, J.P. took this carton of milk and some cheese whiz and the... What? What? So you're telling me my buddy J.P. did not form bank... Oh. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, that makes, that makes more sense now. Okay, so in 1912... 
J.P. Morgan was called on to testify before a congressional committee investigating the existence of a shady money trust, a small group of elite Wall Street financiers, including Morgan, who allegedly colluded to control American banking and industry. Because of his wheeling and dealing, what government-related financial institution was largely traced back to J.P. Morgan and this congressional committee hearing? I'll be back with the answer and maybe some of Joe's mom's homemade guacamole in just a moment. No, G, a big thank you to uh, RX Bar for supporting Stacking Benjamins. You know, when I go out for a run, love to have my RX Bar. Sometimes before, usually after, it's a whole food protein bar made with 100% whole ingredients. And as they say, no BS, right? Which means no added sugars, artificial colors, artificial flavors, preservatives, fillers made with 100% whole ingredients. They use just a few simple, clean ingredients where everything serves a purpose. As an example, egg whites are a main source of its protein that's easy for your body to absorb. RX bars are gluten-free, soy-free, dairy-free. I am lactose intolerant and have not had a problem with my family being around me with an RX bar. No added sugar, no artificial colors. They come in 11 delicious flavor varieties. Whether you like sweet or savory, chocolate or fruit, there's an RX bar for you. They actually taste really good. And this is the thing is that I've had lots of these bars and RX bars for me are the ones that taste the best, which is why I like having them as a partner. You can actually taste the cocoa, the real fruit, the spices like sea salt. It's all there. So for you, if it's breakfast on the go, snack at the office, if you're taking a plane ride and you're going to be in the air just a little long, you don't want to be held hostage to airline food, toss it in your backpack for a bike ride or for a hike. Or like me, you're using it for your pre or post-workout snack, uh, RX Bar is the way to go. Remember, it's 25% off your first order at rxbar.com forward slash SB. I wish it were 25% off all the time, like I said the first time, but that's not the case. But it is 25% off your first order, which is fantastic. Use promo code SB for that. That's rxbar.com forward slash SB, promo code SB. Another one of my favorite companies is House Call Pro. Let me tell you about this. If you're coming to my house to work on my house and your billing is a mess and nothing's itemized and I'm not really sure exactly what the heck's going on, it doesn't make you look good and it doesn't make your business look good. It's hard for me to refer you to other people and I know a lot of other people are exactly like me that way. House Call Pro is designed for any service business, and it's this cool, easy-to-use app which allows you, if you run a service business, to spend more time with your family, more time doing the things you love, and better than that, I think you look good for your customer. It's voted the number one software to run your business on the go, saves you time organizing your business. Here's all the different things that it does. When it comes to scheduling, you can easily schedule appointments, so people know when you're going to be there. They know when you're leaving. You can use it for dispatching. You can send customers SMS updates to the entire process. I love that part. Online booking, payment processing, it's all there. So if you're ready to get your service business organized and streamline with your customers, head to housecallpro.com slash SB. Tell them Stacky Benjamin set you and you know what they're going to do? They're going to waive your $99 activation fee. Housecallpro.com slash SB. Hey there, trivia nerds. You know, I've been reading a little about this J.P. Morgan guy, the real one, not my buddy from the seventh grade, and I'm a little bit confused. J.P. Morgan liked investments with a high yield, but I don't like to yield. Heck, I'm full on all the time. He also wanted to get interest, but I've heard that if you aren't already interested in something, you can't just fake interest. I think he's got it all wrong. Somehow, this dude managed to cobble up enough of a career to be the subject of today's trivia segment. Our question was this, because of his wheeling and dealing, what government-related financial institution was largely traced back to J.P. Morgan and a 1912 Congressional Committee hearing? If you said the Federal Reserve, that'd be correct! 
In an effort to make banking more transparent, the Federal Reserve was established in December 1913, as well as the Clayton Antitrust Act of 1914. What's the lesson here? I think that it's focusing on these obscure things like yield and interest don't pay dividends. Am I right? See ya. Big thanks to Jordan Harbinger for coming down to the basement. You know, he's he's got a great point, OG, that your network is something I think a lot of us go, ah, yeah, I'll work on that later. I'll, I'll be sociable later. I can do my stuff myself, but but you don't know when you're going to go to your company and the door's locked and you can't get back in. <laughs> Are you trying to tell me something? <laughs> Not next time. Did you get something in the mail recently? I did. I just get a red <laughs> stapler in the mail. That's it. That's we're going to have to have you move your desk all the way back over there. corner. I wonder who that could have came from. I don't know. Where, where could that have come from? Hey, uh, I got an idea, OG. Let's throw a Taven Lifeline. Why don't we? We never do that. Let's do it, just in case. We're going to tackle some of life's, or rather life insurance's most important questions because our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they're disrupting the life insurance industry by focusing on those two things you value most. Wells Fargo sales incentives and international bonds. <laughs> <laughs> or your family and your time. It's why they've created a simple way to buy affordable and dependable term life insurance online. Go to stackybedjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now. And guess what you're going to get? Number one, you'll get a free estimate for coverage. And number two, you're going to learn about life insurance the modern way, i.e. much, much faster than the old way. And uh, today we're going to throw out the Haven Lifeline to our new friend, Dom. Say hi, Dom. Hey, guys. First off, I want to say I'm really enjoying Money in the Morning as a supplement to Stacking Benjamins. My question is about building a portfolio of individual stocks. I want to implement a strategy in what I think Joe would call my sandbox, where I purchase around 25 different stocks equally weighted and rebalance annually. I've never purchased any individual stocks before, so I was wondering what are the good and bad ways to go about this. 25 or so seems like a lot of different stocks to purchase. So are there good and bad places fee-wise to purchase these? Are there places you like that make the trades easy and provide a nice overview of a custom portfolio like this? Any insights, suggestions, or thoughts would be helpful. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks for the question, Dom. Thanks also for talking about money in the morning. We have fun there. Another podcast, very short, five days a week, 15 minutes, money in the morning, wherever you're listening to this. So thanks for that. Your sandbox portfolio. This is, I think this is a ton of fun. Am I taking this one, man? You can start it. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you ask about good and bad ways to pick your sandbox. Number one is that obviously when you're dealing with individual trades, uh, trading costs are a difficulty. But remember, you're a buy and hold investor, and I don't want fees to wag the dog. I really like TD Ameritrade's tools. Uh, they have a great suite of tools for examining individual stocks. I've used them myself. Also, if I can find other tools online, you can't go wrong with Robinhood, right? Because you're not going to pay any fee for your sandbox there. Now realize you get what you pay for. It's a bare bones service at Robinhood, but you're not going to pay any fee. So if you've got a place to do your analysis that's separate, that's fine. But if you're trying to keep them balanced, you know, there's M1 Finance. Uh, we're friends with those guys. And for a good reason, we really respect what they do. So uh, having, if you're going to put 25 stocks together, that's a, that's a thing to do. If you're going to put 25 stocks together, that's also a target. So there's three of them. There are probably others, but but talking about the actual picking of the stocks, uh, there's two different types of analysis. There's what's called fundamental analysis, and there's technical analysis. Fundamental analysis is where you're looking at the guts of the company and how that company performs. You're also looking at how that company competes against other companies. So you're really not paying attention to the stock market. You're paying attention to the underlying company and whether that's a quality company or not. And if you believe that the economy is based on good companies performing, then companies that perform really well, their stock will also go up as a result of doing a good job. Technical analysis is more, uh, I look at it like it's tea leaves, right? Or it's some of this mystical stuff, but because so many people believe it. Because so many people believe the candlestick, so many people believe the MACD, the stochastic, they believe these, these technical terms work. 
they work much of the time. But it's because you've got so many traders that are using these same indicators that you might want to be aware of of those two. So, um, and we can dig in a little bit. I don't want to dig into technical analysis very much because I think it is voodoo to some degree, but we, we can dig into fundamentals for a second. The thing that I would add here is when you're trying to have fun with stocks, which is basically what Dom said he's doing here, right? 25 is too much. What it sounds like he's trying to do is have fun with stocks and build an investment portfolio. And, and at the end of the day, I think you've got to stick to your normal tempo of investing, whether it's mutual funds or ETFs or whatever the case may be, and hand that off to somebody else to pick the, the, the broad-based allocation. If you want to have fun with a stock or two or five, that's fine. But when you get to like 25, all you've got is a closet index fund that's going to cost you personally way more than just buying a, uh, an ETF off the shelf. And then you've got all those other things that you mentioned, right? So even at the lowest cost transactions, you know, at a brokerage company, you're talking about what, five bucks a trade? You get 25 stocks, that's 125 purchases. Yeah, I just think in your, especially if this is your sandbox, you don't have time to keep up with that many companies. You just don't. Even if you're going to rebalance it once a year, are you going to be investing every month into it? Or are you just going to dump 10 grand into this, you know, and let it, let it go. And then you've got the other issue of like buying one share, (laughs) you know, like if you want Amazon to be in your sandbox, you have to have a 25,000 seat sandbox because Amazon's freaking a thousand a share right now, you know, so have fun with stocks if you want, but this is not the, uh, the, how do I get rich in 30 seconds plan? Totally agree. And if I'm digging into a few stocks, maybe four or five, I'm looking at a few things. I don't want them to compete against each other. I've Mm -hmm. talked about how I made a bunch of money on XM stock and I went to, to sell it when that stock was through the roof a while ago. It's been a long time since that. And I sold off uh, half of it and bought Sirius stock. And then they merged. Now I own the entire satellite radio network. Congratulations. <laughs> Just idiocy. Don't do that. Buy stocks that are in different portions of the market. Think about those portions of the market, not just in terms of what you think is hot now, but two other things. What you know an area that you might be close to uh, because you're going to do better for a couple of reasons. Number one, you kind of know the heartbeat of that industry, but then number two, you're more likely to follow it. You know, I use Flipboard and I've got my favorite stuff that I follow. I follow bicycle racing and I follow board games as an example of just a couple of hobbies that I like to follow. And so if I do something around bicycle companies, bicycle makers, I'm probably going to do a little better just because I enjoy reading about that stuff, right? So if I'm playing, I'm going to play there. Then what I want to do is with fundamental analysis, I'll just give you a couple things. I want to be in an industry leader. I want to be in either the number one or the number two company in that area. I don't want to bet on the long shot that I think is going to probably someday, hopefully maybe make it. I love those stories, OG, but they're big stories for a reason. They don't happen very often. Right. And I see it's hard to pick those people in advance. Yeah. Yeah. Pick the leader and you're far more likely to do well. Leaders generally stay the leaders, right? They're the leader for a reason. And then I want to look at a couple numbers. I want to look at earnings and I want to see those earnings going up. And I also want to see the earnings per share go up. And the reason that I'm looking at both of those numbers and not just one is that if there's been a merger, if there's been something where they've taken shares and they've diluted the shares over time, I've made the mistake before. Most of my investing prowess is because of mistakes that I've made. <laughs> and then you learn from those and you just don't touch the stove twice. Is that I don't want to invest in a company with rising earnings and not look at underlying what's been going on inside the company because the company's earnings might have bumped up and they just added a ton of debt because of a merger they've right. they've moved there so i want to look also then at free cash flow if a company has more and more free cash flow and by the way when it comes to debt i want to look at how much money that company has in debt yeah, you got to look at their balance sheet yeah the so, sure. so those are a few things there's a few more that i look at but i think uh you know i could overwhelm you with 15 things to look at i would do it the way that i think most people do it learn to follow a couple indicators those indicators will later lead you to other indicators and you know, don't try to bite the whole elephant at one time just take it a little piece at a time and i think those are a great place to start 
Thanks for the question, Dom. Doug also just brought down the mailbag. And today's letter comes to us from our new friend, John. John says, hello, new listener to the show, and I absolutely love it. Started two weeks ago, and I probably listened to 30 episodes. Wow. There's commitment. I started this seven years ago, and I haven't listened to 30 <laughs> episodes. To Gra- Len Penzo has been on it since the very beginning with us. I don't think he's listened to one. So uh, John's winning. I have some traveling coming up and wanted to get your recommendation on books to read. I really wanted Wealth Can't Wait, but my local library doesn't have it available. 27, married, no debt, and I'm looking for more ways to invest rather than the Roth 401k and IRA routes. Thanks, John. Books to read on investing. Well, those are the places that you invest, right? Roth, Roth 401k, IRA. Well, but they're, but, but they're not. I mean, those are tax shelters. Those aren't investments. Yes. Okay. Touche. Yeah. So, John, it's funny. You've got two different things going on there. We always want to use tax shelters as much as possible. We want the tax shelter to fit the goal, though, right? Inside of those or outside of those, we have choices in investments. As an example, right. if, if you want to own rental property inside of your Roth IRA, you can do that. And it's really stupid. It is. You can do it. It is hellaciously difficult. <laughs> And I no, don't stupid is the right word. I don't think I'd recommend it. I don't I, I know some people that do that, but but you've got to know every single little thing to do. Yes. You have to There's know like one guy that does it right. It's a minority. I don't think it's one guy, but I think it's a minority of people. Yeah, yeah. We get far more questions about people doing that incorrectly. But books on investments. You know, I like investment basic books if I'm gonna kick off this discussion. I like uh, Louis Navalier's book which is now over a decade old, maybe 15 years old. What is it? The little book that makes you rich? Yeah, there you go. Louis Navalier's book. If you want a broad spectrum of investments, you can't go wrong with Rick Edelman's The Truth About Money. Gives you a nice, broad, even keel overview of financial planning, tax shelters, investing, just gives you... I like that book because it's so even-handed. Rick doesn't write like he has an ax to grind. Uh, So I enjoy that one. If you're really bored and want to read a big tome on it, uh, Stocks for the Long Run, it's kind of more of an educational type piece, right? Yeah. And if you are, Dom, looking at your sandbox portion of your investments, I really like Stock Market Wizards, and that's interviews with stock traders um, and shows some of the things that they do to become wealthy. And what I don't like there, so I get all excited. And I read Stock Market Wizards. This is a cautionary tale. <laughs> and and I all of a sudden want to be a stock jock and trade more just because I'm fired up. And I realize that the reason these people are great and the one thing they don't say in the book, but the one theme that you'll get, they have a strategy. They approach it every day. They're disciplined. They're consistent. They don't get super emotional. They, they continue to work it. And uh, so I would I would watch out for that because what did I do? I got emotional, got excited, <laughs> did great stuff for about no strategy. Well, I had a strategy, but I worked it for maybe three and a half weeks before I uh, was yeah. back to my regular routine. Go baby, go! A uh, number four, number four horse in the number three race. That was my strategy. <laughs> number four horse. I like uh, you know from a from a uh, market history standpoint. I'm much more interested in learning about the things that have happened in the past, right? And kind of using that information to kind of guide. Versus the things that have happened in the future? Yeah, you know, one of my favorite stock market books is Fooling Some of the People All of the Time. And again, from a cautionary tale standpoint, it talks about how you can be right for a really long time and still lose money. And uh, now this guy who writes the book, his name is David Einhorn, and he uh, runs a hedge fund. The good news is that he had billions of dollars that he could be he could be right. He could he could withstand the time. But a lot of times, if you look at it from the perspective of an average investor, you don't have that bandwidth. Right. So so that and then what was that uh, what was the video, the China thing about how people are getting screwed? Yeah. Uh, the China hustle. John Hustle. And then we profiled it a week or so ago on the show. But just again, a cautionary tale to talk about how there's so much money involved and how insignificant you are <laughs> in the trading game. That profile piece, a documentary on the China Hustle, you know, and how, how screwed up that is and just how everyday people are getting hosed. I think a balancing between all that rah-rah stuff of, hey, you can 
you know, you can do this too. And then, oh, by the way, P.S., there's other bad players in the game. Be aware, um, I think is a, I think is a good mix. I would also say any book written by Michael Lewis is going to be a winner. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. that's, there's always good stuff there. And if you start at the very beginning with Liar's Poker, I think, uh, I think you're going to have, uh, A, be entertained and B, learn a lot from Michael Lewis's writing. Annie Duke's new book too, but heavy, heavy, but I learned a ton from Annie Duke's book. I, I thought that was fantastic read as well. And if you're looking for a good story about frugality, I think the Meet the Frugal Woods book is a great tale there, but he's more interested in stocks. Thanks for the question. If you've got a question for the show, head to Stacking Benjamins and across the top of the page, you'll see questions for the show. Click there and it will show you all the ways that you can ask us a question. If you're somebody who is uh, not playing in the sandbox, you're not playing around anymore, OG. Instead, you're getting focused. You're getting your act together. You know, you maybe just filed your taxes and you're like, I can do way better than this on the amount of money that I make. Guess what you're doing? You're going to stackingbenjamins.com forward slash letter O, letter G, because OG's taking clients. So find out exactly what it would take to get OG's in your corner by using that link. All right. That's going to do it for today, kitties. OG, thanks for playing again. I will be here in another day, I promise. Doug, what should we have learned, man? So what did we learn today? First, take some advice from Jordan Harbinger. Build your network not just because you need help today, but because it's a proven road to career success. By building it early, you'll have resources available when you most need help. Second, looking for places to hide your money during volatile markets? It's better not to play that game. Just remember the time frame for your goals and use investments that fit that time frame and you won't have to worry about market conditions before that date. But the big lesson? Obviously, if you're thinking of high-powered people to build your network, you're probably thinking you should hook up with old Doug on social media. Yeah, that's what you're thinking. Well, pick a number, folks. I'll be your Facebook buddy for just $25.99. On sale only this week. Or, you know, you could just buy the appetizer next Tuesday at the Sizzler. They're both good. Special thanks to Jordan Harbinger for joining us today. You'll find the Jordan Harbinger Show wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks also to my friends in our secret podcast announcer group. We're secretly controlling the game from the inside. We're just completely in the... What? I'm not supposed to, not supposed to talk about, okay, not supposed to talk about, <laughs> okay, did I say secret podcast and answer group? I meant uh, secret frisbee and ice cream lovers group, frisbees and ice cream, it's all we're doing on Tuesday, sometimes we put them together, sometimes they're separate, we throw the frisbee, sometimes we throw the ice cream, it's just, it's all, we're, we're not really doing anything secret podcasting or anything, not trying to take down Ryan Seacrest or anything like that, promise. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at, at @sbenjaminscast or on our Facebook page. Shannon Cowan is our community manager and social media guru. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm wondering if KY Jelly is actually made in Kentucky. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor.
Welcome to the after show. Today we're going to feature a public service announcement for your benefit. Hi, America. My name's David Taylor. I'm the CEO of the company that makes Tide and its corollary product, Tide Pods, which is what I want to talk to you about today. You gotta stop eating the Tide Pods, okay? Look, I get it. You guys are young. You're hip. You don't want an old guy telling you what to do. But Tide Pods are soap, and that's not food. So please stop eating the Tide Pods. And make sure to keep an eye out for Cascade Dish Pops, the lollipop that cleans your dishes. That lolly... Uh, can we stop? Can we, sorry. Are we calling it a lollipop? I'd love to see one if I could. Just get it. If we can find one in. <laughs> Our company has been innovating new products since it was founded. And we're proud to continue that tradition with our Vicks VapoRub Winter Blast gum-flavored bonbons. Do these look just like mints, like diner mints? I'm, I'm looking at it, and man, that looks like a mint to me. I mean, <laughs> am I crazy? It's just like the same as Tide Pods. What do you mean the same as Tide Pods? Oh, oh, you're kidding me. We're going to get our f***ing handed to us in court. You're not rolling on this, are you? Forget dryer sheets. With Gain Brand Dryer Powder, you simply pour the powder into the mixer. You take your dryer stick right here, and this is cotton candy. Am I the a Like, how do you not get, we, can we just cut, can we cut, can you cut the camera real quick? I'm, I'm trying to understand right now how this happened. I've been busting my ass on this Tide Pods fiasco, and I turned my back for three seconds, and now our entire line of products is shaped like candy. And I'm trying to understand how this happened. Why are you crying? With Tampax Push Sickles, you get to choose between Chili Cherry, Frosty Fruit Punch, or Ice Cold Cranberry. We, okay, not only should none of these be flavored, because why would you flavor them? This is the coldest thing I've ever held. And, as in everything else today, people will try to eat these. Even if they're not poisonous, we don't want people eating tampons. Why are they poisonous? You'll go cuckoo for cleanliness with our cocoa butter premium Pampers <laughs> brand chuck so the kids eat <laughs> Right? That's what this is? The kids, they eat it's chocolate, diaper, poop. Let's see here. Oh, there it is. Is it chocolate? Is it poop? Do we care? Does anyone care? Who knows? Who gives a f**k, right? I'm not gonna do this product, so we'll be moving on. Okay. Try Crest brand dinner paste for the hungry consumer on the go. Throw a fluoride-filled meal bag in your gullet? Oh, f So we do make food. So we do now make food. Meal bag. I'll kill you. It doesn't matter if we make the day because none of this is gonna be usable. Do you understand? That's a hamburger. It's a razor. That's a razor. <laughs> That's a Gillette razor. Bring me shaving cream right now. And if it doesn't shave my face, it's your ass. You get that, right? Here we go. Oh my God. That is a killer shave. That is like baby's bottom smooth. The other stuff I don't know about, but this is, the hamburger is working for me. Thanks to College Humor for, for that. Nice job, College Humor. I'm glad that you, uh, that you didn't see that because your reactions are priceless. <laughs> just, I'm crying. This is, this is cotton candy. 